to so I my recommendation would be to find out who's teaching it and what their qualifications are. This is actually a good point, Cole, because I agree with you. A lot of training courses that are actually being uh, presented by a real trainers that do not have hands-on experience, which is great because those people specifically have, you know, a ton of knowledge on how to deliver a content. But for someone who is looking for, you know, really, really great experience, I'm not saying that, you know, premier field engineers are always the great trainers, but of course, you know, if you are, if you're already introduced to SharePoint 2010, if you've done a little bit in there and have a lot of questions, it might be a good idea to uh, train with the field engineer. But again, everyone has a different style of uh, presenting this. Mm -hmm. What's the name of the company with uh, Scott and Andrew Connell? And that, that critical path. Uh, the critical path. Everything that I uh, with them, they had some. They have a lot of free training online, and everything I've seen with them has been very impress impressive. So that's one thing I might check out. Um, uh, Laura, I don't think is on to plug her company, but I believe they do SharePoint training as well. I'd underscore both of those. Uh, Ted and Andrew's uh, critical path are development centric, uh, developer centric, and um, SharePoint 911 is going to be admin focused. So if they want to go admin, I'd, I'd suggest looking towards SharePoint 911. Not that you don't pick it all up from everything, but uh, they're all good for all those guys. <laughs> Well, I think it always depends on who is delivering the content. And once you've chosen the right course for yourself, you need to find, you know, a really good person to deliver it. I, and I, you know, you could look at it as a part of a planning, but I, I don't know. And, and I, I see architecture missing from this list, and all too often. I work in the mid-market space, the small to mid um, company space, and all too often I'll go in and find, you know, SharePoint servers under a desk, or uh, can we just run this on this gear, or you know, things, things of that nature, which, you know, SharePoint's a very powerful platform, and it does a whole bunch of very, very powerful things, but those powerful things need you know, power to operate, really. Uh, and, and not enough, I think, thought goes into that, as well as, as usage patterns change over time, the continuous review of how we're using the system. You often go in with a farm that's big enough for a few users in a test environment, and if that gets adopted and, and, and taken up through the organization, not enough consideration, I think, goes back into reviewing what these usage patterns are and what that means to uh, our, our farm architecture. Maybe we need to start splitting up extra servers, et cetera, et cetera. I know it's a very hardware sort of geeky thing to talk about, but uh, it has all kinds of implications to, at the end of the day, user experience. Because if they, you know, users aren't having a nice, quick, uh, reliable experience with the system, they're going to they're gonna drop it on the hot potato. And I don't know if it's, if it's a miss or something like that. When it comes to, uh, again, you know, I'm talking personal experience, I, I also find that Far too often, end users are left out of the picture when you're doing any planning or you're doing any goes. The actual people who are going to use the system are usually the last ones to get consulted, and that's a recipe for disaster too. Because users will always find a way around a system that they don't want to use. So you know, the, the, the inclusion of I don't know how you excuse me phrase it, but uh, inclusion of the of the correct um, interested parties. Mm -hmm. Can I? I think purpose is also really important because if if people don't see the point to it, like how is this going to make my job easier, you've got to have that to be able to get users to want to use it. Yeah, they, they, they rarely get included. All these things are often top down. Um, uh, I guess another thing, a point I didn't make, but I think it's part of the, part of the reason is oftentimes a SharePoint deployment is coming from the IT department. And, Coming back to uh, Sandy's point of purpose, they don't know why. They just know that this, you know, this is a real cool platform that they want to put out there. Uh, if you get a business driver, in most of our case, again, we're working with BI, so we're saying here, put this in to support the BI. That's usually coming from uh, 
in the business end of things. And when you have a business driver driving that whole process, the adoption rate tends to go up because there is a very, very clear purpose right off the bat. Even if it's only one purpose initially, there, there is at least one that gets people with some experience with the system. Um, so let me uh, be first uh, a little bit clear about what actually happened. So there was this LinkedIn group that, uh, and a conversation that I was not a part of, um, and a coworker actually turned me on to this conversation that was happening, um, asking this very question. I don't know Angelique or, or you know, what the context of even the group was that she asked these questions about folders and metadata and of course the never ending discussion that uh, consultants seem to have. But anyway, so uh, one of the responders um, highlighted three posts that I made, and uh, I'm sure, okay, so she has shared them in the chat. So, um, so they are basically, uh, you see three posts. If you start with the first one, it was back in the 2007 days, where I basically, um, uh, under the tutelage of, of someone who uh, uh, trained, taught me a lot about information architecture, just basically taught me that, you know, Folders were never the way to go. Um, and so in 2007, for about a year, that was about what I just what I told clients just to uh, turn them off on library. That's where I was on that. Then about a year later, SharePoint 2010 comes out um, and undergoes a bit of a revolution in how they understand folders, metadata inheritance of folders. So it's a little bit better, so I backed off my position a little bit in the second post. And then someone actually commented on my blog and asked me, "Can you give me a visual demonstration of how to use this? Um, because, like Angelique mentioned in this post, I don't really understand this value proposition you're talking about about getting away from folders. So it prompted me to do a video uh, of SharePoint 2010 functionality with folders, using metadata, uh, based navigation, and grouping and view instead of using so I walked through both of them. So I'm not going to rehash all that experience because now you can do that. Um, so I basically answered this question, uh, which is her main question, is that why would I teach users to use a different paradigm as opposed to folders? And I, and I go through all of that. And I think the single biggest reason is people are not shown visually the benefits. Because we all understand how folders work. We're used to the paradigm back from the hanging file folder days in our cabinets, which is why it was brought over in the U.S. paradigm. Uh, Windows and Apple, um, but uh, we also understand the pain of trying to navigate someone else's folder structure. So, um, so anyway, so my presentation is there is showing um, how to alleviate some of those experience issues and how to maximize the 2010 gifts and, and try and strike a balance. So I don't think folders are necessarily bad in every circumstance, although I do think they are a kind of debunk, a uh, very, um, uh, the, the paradigm is long in the tooth. And SharePoint provides a great way to think other than that, which I hope our OS is start getting up on. But um, anyway, so uh, if you're interested in that, I walk through all the different uh, things that will hopefully help you feel free. Um, I just want to talk today and use to help the students care about it. And uh, the one that I pasted is the most recent one. So the other two are uh, an earlier evolution of my thinking on it. So if you want the most up to date, how I educate you. If you're interested, you do that and visually show the benefits of why it's better. Um, I don't even think necessarily anymore the problem is necessarily with the folder itself, like you almost demonize a folder. Um, the problem is when we start nesting them and mislabeling them, and then it becomes a problem. Um, so, anyway, so I think it's, it's, a, it's a mixture of. Um, it's, it's sometimes just a lot of information architects talk about just the theoretical exercise, but for you to understand, they need to be shown visually, and that's uh, what I tried to endeavor in that video. And uh, I got a lot of great feedback, um, so hopefully someone else will find it. Yes, I'm curious if anyone has any experience in developing or know of any tools that can provide context sensitive help in SharePoint. I've heard the requirement before, but I'm afraid I haven't heard any suggestions. Yeah, 
I missed the last part of it. Did you say context sensitive help? Yes, I did. Based on what page you're on and perhaps what web part on what page, be able to click a, a help icon and have the, the help context understand uh, where, where you were when you asked for help and, and present, you know, um, either a textual document or a video of how to operate that page, that that web part, etc. Right, and and you're familiar with the settings out of the box that the site collection level settings. No, I'm really not very aware of this. This requirement just came up today, so I figured I'd, I'd ask for help online. Um, there's ah, site okay. requirement settings for for help. Right, so out of the box, uh, if you go on to um, any, I believe it's site collection and not site level, but in the site, certainly in the site collection, if you will have menus, if you're a site collection administrator for uh, the help menus, and it will allow you to select which content you want to be, which out of the box content you want to be available uh, for your users. I mean, that said, Anytime I've seen somebody actually have requirements around um, the help there, they're usually developing their own content. And I know I've seen at least one really good article on how to uh, develop your own help content and wire it up into the um, into into the framework that uh, SharePoint provides. But it, it just what's there is in it's usually not completely appropriate for end users or uh, or it's um, just usually not exactly what people want. Yeah, I, I was looking at the online help. It, got, it seemed useless, and I, if I can, I'd like to replace that with my own content. I didn't know that I could plug into that framework and put my own content in there, so that'll be very useful for me. Yeah, I'll, I'll look up that article. I, I'm sure I can find it again. And um, but in the meantime, I would explore what what you can do, and and you'll you'll see it. Um, yeah, there will be a menu just for help, and then within there, there's just a, a bunch of checkboxes for which type of content you'd like to see in there. Appreciate your help. Thank you.